Welcome to our Urban Legends podcast. I'm Dr. Gloria McDaniel Hall. I've been a teacher, a principal, an assistant superintendent, all within urban schools in Chicago and around the country. Our Urban Legends podcast is a forum for sharing ideas, strategizing together, and supporting each other as we dismantle the deficit narratives sometimes associated with urban education and discuss where and how amazing work is being done. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? I am so excited about the opportunity to speak with you because when I got the chance to work with you, you actually were one of the highlights or the the people who I could not wait to see when I was at work in order to get new ideas. You were always filled with new ideas and new resources for us as principals and as directors in the charter school company that we worked for before. How are you this morning? I'm doing well, doctor. I'm doing well. And thank you for the lead up. I certainly appreciate it. Um, I'm humbled by it. Um, I just, you know, you know me, my focus is children and families and, and communities. And I, I got it honest. I got it from my mother and my father and my grandparents. Um, uh, I come from a family of educators, a, a group of people who believe that our work on this planet is to serve and to leave it a better place. And so Absolutely. that's how I see my work. And um, so anytime I'm sharing anything, I feel obligated to do so. So uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. That's amazing. So typically this is the first time before I was gonna speak to you, I didn't have like titles for my segment, but this time I titled it The Real Deal because you are the real deal. Mm -hmm. Like every time I have the chance to speak with you, I know that I'm gonna leave differently than before I had the opportunity to talk with you. Um, and so I know that when I met you, when you were at Riverton, um, the charter school where you worked as principal in New York, um, they didn't turn it, call it turnaround, but mm -hmm. it was kind of the work we were doing was turnaround mm -hmm. work um, in the division that we were working in. So before we get started, could you just briefly describe like your journey in education like from the beginning to the end, even if you want to go back to your school experiences, because I know those impact how you showed up as a principal when I met you. Wow, that's great. Um, so I don't have uh, many opportunities to talk a little bit about it. Um, I am a graduate of uh, New York City Schools. Um, uh, I am a graduate of the State University of New York at Old Westbury and uh, also um, a graduate of uh, Baruch College with the New York City Leadership Academy uh, program, which was a first of its kind in the country. Uh, I'm a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College as well, the art of teaching. So I have a wonderful background that sort of uh, takes into account um, uh, sort of uh, conservative but progressive education and, and really gave me an opportunity to really try to understand uh, uh, what I really truly think about education. Um, in 1989 was when I actually completed my undergraduate studies and um, I stepped into my first position as a teacher in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Prior to that, for the two years um, or for two years prior to stepping into that position, I was a teacher's aide. I was a school aide. And uh, there I would say, I dare say, I learned so much. Um, I had an opportunity to look at an entire school from a different perspective. Uh, I had an opportunity to dream and to dream about what I would like to do and what I would not like to do, what I did not think worked for students. Um, so uh, that was my beginning. And, and so I taught um, a number of grade levels. Uh, my degree was in early childhood um, in through six. And so I've taught uh, second grade, I've taught fourth grade, fifth grade, um, I've taught sixth, seventh and eighth grades. And so uh, that's pretty much my teaching experience, um, teaching all the subjects, common branches is what we call them in New York City. Um, whereas when you have a self-contained classroom, you teach everything. Yes. And that means lesson plans for everything. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience. But from there, uh, my uh, community superintendent, who is now um, the uh, chancellor of the New York State Department of Education, um, saw something in me and made the decision to uh, extend to me the opportunity to become a staff developer in the district and to work particularly with 
a struggling school, um, which was in the Fort Greene section of Brooklyn. Um, from there, I ended up uh, making a decision to uh, work under a phenomenal educator. Her name is Shelly Harwain, and she was the superintendent of District 2. And, and from then, I opened uh, with a colleague of mine, Frederick Douglass Academy, uh, number four, which was a wonderful experience. And, and then, of course, uh, everything moved on from there. I became a principal of uh, Middle School 584, the Granville T. Woods uh, School for Science and Technology, which is a New York City Department of Education public school, a middle school, uh, which is my favorite. My um, favorite too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, but you have to be built for that. You know, you yes. have to want it. And if you don't want it, don't go there. Yes. Um, but, but I love it. And, and uh, from there, I was uh, uh, extended the invitation to become a network leader, uh, which placed me at the helm of 22 New York City middle and high schools. And that was a wonderful experience. And, and then I just feel just blessed to have then been asked by the deputy chancellor to step into a position and lead the campaign for middle school success, which was to improve uh, middle schools across New York City, um, over 600 middle schools. And we had a very robust and rich campaign to improve the quality of teaching and learning um, for early adolescents. And uh, that was a rich experience. And, and from there, that's what got me into um, charter schools and really exploring the possibilities and the uh, potential of charter schools. And uh, so I ended up leaving that position to step into an invitation to National Heritage Academies. And that's when I was first introduced to a new school that was opening in my very community. So I live in District 29 in, in uh, Queens, New York, and that's exactly where this school was opening. Um, the school had a legacy. St. Catharines was a, a historic uh, school. Uh, some very famous people attended that school years uh, and years past. However, the school sort of fell into disrepair and, and, and also the schools in that community were low performing. And so a community, uh, a group of community agents made the decision that they needed something better. They uh, drafted uh, a proposal, they submitted their application and they were approved and they were looking for an initial principal and I became that person. And so it was a wonderful four years as school leader there and, and from there on to become a, a, a director of school quality for all of the New York State um, uh, National Heritage Academy schools, which was another wonderful experience. Um, but from there, then I ended up going into um, uh, back to New York City. So I was called this time by the chancellor who asked me, would I come and lead the office of charter schools? So I became the executive director of the Office of Charter Schools in the New York City Department of Education, uh, where we authorized and oversaw uh, a number of charter schools and worked with the state uh, in order to provide the best quality of charter schools or schools um, uh, that we could uh, 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 facilitate. And then the last stop um, up until now, because um, there are more stops to come, um, was the opportunity to come out here to Abu Dhabi. And uh, I was invited by Her Excellency uh, directly, who came to New York uh, and asked and extended a direct invitation to come over here and open uh, the first of what is now 22 charter schools. And so we have 22 charter schools serving approximately 30,000 children. And so it's a, a, a rather um, aspirational project. Um, it is yielding fruit. And, um, you know, I'm just blessed and happy to be a part of it. Sorry for the lengthy, uh, yeah, but I've been around for 34 <laughs> years. I've been around for 34 years. And, and you deserve lengthy. So, so one question that I don't have on our list that we talked about is, it, what, what do you see as the difference or is there a difference in, say, middle schoolers in New York that you um, worked with, middle schoolers in Abu Dhabi? Do you see are the children just basically the same like is it the same things they're struggling with that we were struggling with the same yeah absolutely it's the same it's no different right. and and it's a, I, I try to convince people that it is the same no matter what so if you're talking about parent engagement we run into the same challenges if you're talking about standards unpacking standards looking at the official curriculum and trying to effectively run through what it is students are you want students to know and be able to do how will you know they're able to do it what will you do when they're unable to do it or they exceed what it is your expectations yes. were 
which is the enrichment portion, it is the same challenges. And so it, with regards to the middle schoolers, developmentally, that is the focus, right? How do you ensure that those who are facilitating learning for the early adolescents, that they understand what they're going through developmentally? And so that is an extremely important piece. And, and so it is the same there where their bodies are changing. Um, uh, they are questioning everything. Um, uh, there are things that they want to convey, they understand, but they don't quite understand it. But the way that you have to help walk them through is not a push or pull, but it's a gentle walk along, yes. right? And, and so uh, it is no different here. And so we find some of the same challenges. As a matter of fact, that same blueprint for middle school success that we created in New York City, I've shared here in Abu Dhabi and some principals were extremely grateful to have received something that was so research-based um, uh, that really speaks to how a community can work together, uh, including parents, to better understand their early adolescent learners and then provide them with the supports that they need in order to help them develop the kind of agency within themselves that is necessary for them to thrive and move on to the next stage. Amazing. So another hallmark of yours, and I know that this is the um, focus of the dissertation that you are completing, is real character education in schools and how it impacts what our results are. Um, can you speak a little bit to what makes character education real in schools and how did you how did you establish that at Riverton? I saw it firsthand, but I didn't see like all the things you did behind the scenes to make that a possibility. Yeah, so one of the things that sort of drove me to really begin to think about virtues and character education really had to do with empowerment, right? And, and so, and, and agency. And so um, we find in many of our schools, we as adults, those who are directly charged with improving the quality of education throughout our schools, we feel as though we have to design the program, we have to deliver, and then we have to assess, right? So we do everything, right? And we just place it on the kid to do and to follow our lead. What I understood at my, during my first um, uh, during my tenure, the tenure of my first school, which was middle school 584, was that there is so much our children come to us with. There are so many um, interests, desires, intelligences, right, that they bring. But we tend to tell them what they are not. And when we do those things, we discount opportunities to be able to see what it is they can bring, what it is they can do. And, and so when I was at Riverton, I had an opportunity to really, really hone in on us really working with our students um, to give them the opportunities to show what they can do. And, and the way that we did that was to equip them with tools. And so when we are talking about the virtues and developing those virtues of um, uh, those character virtues of compassion, how to show compassion towards someone else, how to be empathetic, how to be an empathetic listener, how to be an, uh, uh, um, how to be, uh, uh, how to persevere, um, which is a big one, right? Not giving up. Um, uh, these are all the types of practices that help to make an individual um, uh, make it through those periods that become very difficult, that become very challenging, which we all face. We know we see it in some schools where students, with some of our young people, where some of our students, when, when, the, when the storms come, or when it's not even a storm these days, when it's a little rain shower, people are ready to pack up their tent and go. Oh, yes. You know, yes. let's move. Um, but the reality is, is that he or she who can endure it to the end is the one that will reap the rewards. And, and so if we can help our students understand that storm clouds will come, that there will be challenges, these are some of the things that you can do in order to weather the storm and to move through because tomorrow is another day, then we have done a great job of helping them just last and move on. Because very often what comes behind that midnight, right, is light. And, and, yes. and so that's something, particularly when you talk about middle schoolers, high schoolers, and so on, they need to understand that. And so that, that, that is one piece of it, equipping them um, with the understanding and the tools 
in order to effectively push through some of these challenging periods. And yeah. so that's something I'm, I feel strongly about. And, and um, the last thing I'll say to this is, um, the, it, it connects to what I originally said, which is we are focused on closing achievement and opportunity gaps. We, over the years, have been trying, trying, trying different policies, whether it be national policies or whether we're, whether we're talking local policies or have all been implemented. <laughs> yes. Everything has been laid out. Unfortunately, we find ourselves in some of the same spaces and the same conditions that I experienced when I first entered the Department of Education in 1987. Yes. Now, yes. now, when I look back, I say, why are, we, why are we not making progress? Why are we not getting to where we need to get? And, and what I found when we uh, launched Riverton, when we had daily assembly sessions, when we had students come up and they themselves talk about virtues, our teachers talking about virtues and explaining how those virtues showed up in their days leading up to that session, um, uh, affirming students who exhibited those virtues. When we did that on a daily basis, I was listening to um, someone the other day, they were talking about, it was uh, Simon Sinek. He talks about one day, okay, two days, okay, three days, okay. You keep looking and you say, wow, I don't see a big difference. After one day, I've been doing my virtues. Two days, I've been doing my virtues. Three days, I've been doing my virtues. But he says something happens over the course of 20 days, yes. 30 days. 50 days, and you will see the difference. You will see students saying, I want to do better for me. Yes. I can do better if I use this. Yes. So these are the things that are of importance to me. And I think in creating a strong culture for learning, I think you cannot exclude students. As a matter of fact, they're the ones you really have to convince that the power is within them. Yes. So another thing that I saw right along the set, because you took my second question, which is like, why haven't we seen the change that we're seeking with all these external things that we've changed around the, the core, which I think is, like you said, teaching students to persevere and really pushing through and using their voices. But I also saw you in the way that you interacted with your staff. So it wasn't just you doing daily assemblies or kids doing the, all those beautiful things you just described, mm -hmm. but it was in the way that you yourself interacted with teachers and your mm -hmm. teachers then interacted with students. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you, how did you do that? Like, how did you make that be the way that your school ran? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I, and I'm glad you noticed because it's really important and it's intentional work. Um, everything begins with mental models. And, and I've had many conversations with school leaders when I became a superintendent about whose school is it? So, so that's where it begins, right? So, so I've had conversations with principals that would continuously say, my school, my school, my, it's not your school. It is not your school. The school belongs to the community. And therefore the community represents a group of stakeholders that you would want to invest themselves in its improvement, right? And, and so it, at, at that school at Riverton, our focus was around distributed leadership, right? It was around empowering others. And so I wanted everyone to be empowered and to feel empowered and to feel as though they had real skin in the game and that they had a say so. And so there were times when we had meetings and my teachers or my deans would hold me accountable to, to, the, to the mission and the vision. So when you walk through our building, you saw the mission, you saw the vision, you saw our values posted throughout the building. And many of them were supported by quotes from everyone from uh, Jim Collins to, to Theodore Roosevelt, right? Um, to, um, uh, who's another one? Maya Angelou. So, so we wanted to create a culture where everyone felt as though they belonged and they had relevance as it related to the mission that we were seeking to accomplish. And, and so um, uh, specifically, if I were to break it down, I understood that I wanted my students to feel empowered. I wanted them to feel, we wanted to make Riverton, if you even look at the logo 
on our sweater that was designed. It took me quite a, I, I actually did that one. And this is one of the things I will say I, I had the opportunity to do. I was fortunate enough where one day I was watching Wimbledon and while watching Wimbledon, you see the seal of Wimbledon and you know what Wimbledon represents. Yes. Right, it's something big. It's something, something historic. It's something that when people say, "I played at Wimbledon," I went to Wimbledon. It's a big deal. Well, um, that is what I was doing. I, I just kept drafting and drafting. Then I ended up working with some other teachers and some other people, and we created that logo. and And we wanted students to be proud when they wore that logo. We wanted them to feel a sense of, "I am investing in my future." But what I understood was. In order for our students to feel that way, the people who directly interacted with them on a daily basis had to be the ones to pour into them. Yes. So I understood that my role was not to leap over my deans and then leap over my teachers in order to meet the needs of my students. My role was to support my deans, to model for my deans, to coach my deans and to make sure I'm loving on my deans the way that I would want my teachers to love on their students yes. and to provide their students with the opportunities that they need in order to be the best that they can be yes. in a very differentiated fashion. So if I'm doing that with my deans and that was the work I believed I needed to do, my deans were expected to do the same for their teachers mm. and to differentiate accordingly and to provide them all the tools, materials that they needed in order to be successful. And so that is professional attention and that is personal attention. And then from there, the deans would expect that of the teachers. Yes. And then the teachers would do that with the students. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way I see a model where everyone is engaged. And of course the parents are engaged at every level. Um, and, and if I had more time, I would talk about our uh, parent action committees that we created, where at every level parents were involved, at the classroom level, at the dean's level, at the, um, uh, the uh, organizational level, the level of governance, um, parents throughout. So it wasn't ceremonial, it wasn't symbolic, parents were involved at every single level and had a voice. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so you you've answered like so many of the questions that I had written but one of the things that I, I want to get at that I saw at Riverton so the day one of the days that I visited I walk up and there's like a first grade young man who holds the door for us and he has a chess game thing like in his hands like he's coming to school to play chess it's an hour before school is supposed to begin and he opens the door we walk in and there's little kids like setting up chess all over the place. Then we did the school visit and I saw a, a music studio, like an actual music studio in the building. And students loved, loved the arts that you provided and the extra curricular things that you provided. And I really believe that impacted your academic scores a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, cause your attendance was off the chart because kids wanted to be there. It wasn't like we had to do all these incentives. We had incentives that were already kind of built in the, the way you did things. Just talk to me about the inclusion of the arts and um, how that impacted the results you were able to get. Yeah, so I, I often talk about the arts. In particular, I talk about um, visual arts. And, and so there have been a couple of, one piece in particular that was uh, written uh, about me and my struggles in high school, just in school in general. And, and I always say that art is what saved me, right? Mm. And so art spoke to my, that intelligence that was within me that was just burgeoning and trying to get out. Um, but uh, in most circumstances, it was, how is Verone doing in math? How is Verone doing in reading? How's he doing in science and social studies? Oh, Verone is in summer school again. Um, but for some reason, well, not for some reason, it was a requirement that I had to take art for a half uh, a year um, and receive, uh, uh, I think it was 0.5 credits uh, in order to graduate. And so my junior year, I took this course and wow, talk about blossoming. 
talk about Verone emerging with an identity. And that was my challenge. I didn't have an identity. I had a wonderful older brother that was phenomenal, very bright, high performer, a younger brother, a younger sister. And they all had this bold identity, but Verone struggled with his identity, mm. right? And, and so art is what gave me something. It's what made my peers in school start to see this work and had uh, uh, people ask me, can you design this? Can you do this? Mm. We have a class mural coming up. Can you do our class mural? And I ended up doing it. It's still, it's still in the building to this day. Oh so, so this is what I wanted for our students. I wanted them to not be limited to these subject areas, right? But to have opportunities to be able to explore, to experiment, and to make a decision as to what is it that really speaks to them? And what is it that's in them that really just just Propel oozes out of them, yes. right? Yes. And and so so that is something that we did. And you know what's interesting? There are a lot of educators that say, but we don't have money for that. Well, I, I was very creative in how we used money, right? Um, but I also understood that I did have my limitations. So this is, again, is what Dr. Comer talks about when he talks about the community, when he talks about the stakeholders of a particular community. The stakeholders are not just limited to those individuals who are in the building on the payroll. There are medical centers, for example, if your children need eyeglasses, if your children need health screening, whatever your children need, then you have a responsibility to go out and try to find those things, to find those opportunities, to find those resources. And so with our parents being stakeholders, they would come in and they would do, we had karate classes, right? They would come in and lead those classes. It was just my responsibility to find out, are you qualified? Are you bonded, right? Because we can't just have anybody in, right. in, the, in front of our children. Right. Um, but, and, and then to be on the spot to watch what's happening. Right. And so we took advantage of a lot of talent that existed outside of our building. And there are a number of tremendous number of people that do that. And uh, the Harlem Children's Zone, Jeffrey Cannon, and the work that he has done and continues yes. to do, um, uh, even though he is retired, he's still working. Um, uh, this is something that more school leaders need to think about. Yes, you are the principal of the school. But the school sits within a community, and in that community are diamonds, golden nuggets, and all kinds of items that can help you achieve that which you're attempting to achieve. Amazing. Okay, so last question, and I know you are really, really good with quotes and <laughs> like things that you say or used to say to me that just like I had to think about it for months and months afterwards. But if you were to summarize just what makes it work um, in terms of your experiences and all the things that, you, that you've seen and the, the work that you've done. Is there a quote that resonates with you about this work and um, our importance of getting this right? Yeah, there, there's a, there, there are a few quotes and, and I, I'm gonna say one thing that um, it, was, it was Maya Angelou who talked about virtues. So I'm going back to virtues. And yes. it was uh, Maya who said um, uh, that of all the virtues, the one virtue that is above all virtues is courage. Mm. You have the courage to do the right thing at the right time for the right people. And, and so being a school leader, being a superintendent, you wrestle with a lot of uh, sort of imbalances, right? And you know that I need to do this. However, mm. I'm going to have challenges if my thing is this, um, and it was said to me by Frank Mickens, who was the famed principal of Boys and Girls High School in New York City when I was just emerging and just coming into my first principalship in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn. And he said, Varone, you must be courageous as you step into this principalship. He was a principal who a lot of people had things to say about. Um, they would say, well, he was un unorthodox or, you know, he was um, uh, headstrong. Um, but here you have a man who took over a school that was a persistently dangerous school, a uh, high school, um, uh, where there were all kinds of challenges, where the students were not invested in learning in the way that one would want. And he flipped that school to where students were dressing for success. They had dress for success days. 
they implemented things that they felt would help them achieve a goal of college and post-secondary learning. This is what this man did. And so when he spoke, I listened um, because I saw his work and I know what Boys and Girls High School was before he got there. And so courage, the courage, courage to, to speak what's right and to do what's right um, for children, for teachers, for parents, and for oneself. This is, uh, this, these are the individuals that make up the community. And, and, and um, we've heard, we've all heard the quote, um, which I think is right. I'm here to do a job and not to save one, right? And so if you're focused on saving a job, then I think you're going to compromise in times and places where you should not, um, where you should stay the course. And, and I, I think the last thing I will say is, is that I'm not going to call any names, but I'm a strong believer in literacy and the development of literacy in youngsters and having a robust plan and, and, and approach to ensuring that students are getting the, the phonemic awareness, uh, the, the work that they need around phonics development, phonemic awareness, um, uh, uh, fluency, uh, as well as comprehension and, and anything else that may be needed in order to help all students become um, uh, literate um, and, and lovers of literature. Right. So um, I remember a time when I had a challenge with my superintendent who felt we were doing a bit much and we were going a bit far outside of what the prescribed curriculum was. And and I told her in no uncertain terms, I said, you hired me to do this work. If at the end of this year, we don't show outcomes and results in accordance to what your expectation is you can fire me, yep. you can get rid of me. And listen, I had a son and a wife. I really don't wanna lose my job, <laughs> Yes. But, but, but I felt strongly enough. See, I, I don't think there are enough people feeling committed to the plans that they're putting forth. Yes. I felt strongly that this plan will work, that our children will succeed with their degree of efficacy and care about their learning and development and a strong plan for developing their competencies around literacy and the writing opportunities, I said, they can only go up. And so I stood by that and sure enough, our school was shining and became a model for others. And so um, I think to be courageous, to know where you guys are going, to communicate that to the entire community and let them be a part of how we're gonna do it I think those are the things that can happen and that can yield tremendous outcomes for all school communities. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best on the completion of your dissertation and the work that you're doing in Abu Dhabi. I can't wait to see the results published somewhere. Thank you so <laughs> Thank you, much. Doctor. Thank you, doctor.